All right. Hello, guys. Hope everybody is out there having a blessed and wonderful day. Today, we are getting to look at Amos chapter 5. Forget the dirty hands. I've been at work. Holy Jesus Louise, this hair is crazy. I promise I didn't get electrocuted. My hair looks like something out of Dragon Ball Z, for Jesus' sakes. All right, guys. Anyways, yeah, we're going to be looking at Amos chapter 5. So let's get into some prayer and we'll read this chapter and see what I got to share with you. I hope you guys have enjoyed this walk through the book so far. Let's do this. Heavenly Father, we want to come before you today, Lord, and we want to praise you for who you are, Father God, the fact that, that you are the great I am. You are omnipotent, you are omniscient, you are you are loving and kind and good. You you are the source of all illumination, Father God. You are the source of all truth. Father God, you have given us the, the, the glorious gift of your Son. You've given us the glorious gift of your law and, and the Holy Spirit poured out on us that day at Pentecost, Lord. You give us daily provisions of faith and grace and mercy, Lord. You are unchanging, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow in a world that moment to moment shifts constantly, Lord. You have called us to something so much better, Lord. You, you have called us to an excellence that by way of the gifts that you provide us, we can actually achieve, that we could glorify you, Father God, in action and in, in, in word, that we could glorify you in thought and in our hearts, Lord, with everything that we do. I would ask today, Lord, that these words be be able to just come alive and to really speak to people watching the video that they would illuminate not, not, not only the meaning of the words, but the things within our hearts that need illuminated, Lord. That the law and, and the prophets and, and all of your scripture, Lord, be a mirror that we can stand before and really see who we are and the things that have to change, Lord. Because with you, we know that we can. Father God, we would pray for a hedge of protection around the lives and a blood covering over the hearts and over the minds of children and the infirm and anyone unable to do so for themselves, Lord. Help us to always have that appetite to serve, Lord, to, to serve you and to serve others, Lord. Help us to remain humble and, and focused. Help us to be sure of the hope that we that we hang all of this on, Lord. Help us to be bold and active and dutiful, Lord, that, that shining city on a hill that screams, this is the gospel message, and this is the Lord's love. Help us to be those people, Lord. Guide us, lead us, and direct us, Lord. And we pray all of this in the mighty, righteous, powerful, and beautiful name of your Son and our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, guys. All right, you beautiful turkeys, let's get into this. I'm so glad to be able to share with you guys. <clears throat> Amos chapter 5. And it is titled, the little subtitle is, A Lament for Israel. Something that comes from a place of, of deep love. You don't lament things that you're only mad or angry at. You lament things that you may be mad or angry at or about, but you do it because you care. We'll talk about that. Verse 1. Hear this word which I take up against you, a lamentation, O house of Israel. The virgin of Israel has fallen. She will rise no more. She lies forsaken on her land. There is no one to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city that goes out by a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which goes out by a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. But do not seek Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor pass over to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, with no one to quench it in Bethel. You who turn justice to wormwood, and lay righteousness to rest in the earth. 
He made the Pleiades and Orion. He turns the shadow of death into morning and makes the day dark as night. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. He rains ruin upon the strong so that fury comes upon the fortress. They hate the one who rebukes in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. Therefore the prudent keep silent at that time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good. Establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore the Lord God of hosts, the Lord says this, There shall be wailing in all streets. And they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas, they shall call the farmer to mourning, and skillful lamenters to wailing. In all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through you, says the Lord. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord, for what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? Mm, Y'all, I'm rereading that again. Verse 26, or verse 20. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. Nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. But let justice run down like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Did you offer me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? You also carried Sekuth, your king, and Shaun, your idols, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. Therefore I will send you into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. So there's a lot going on here. If <laughs> you're Israel, it's not a lot that's good. It could be, but they're so hard-hearted, they're so... Stiff-necked, they're so they're so entrenched in their ways, and sure of their foolishness that that they hear nothing, they see nothing, they they walk through life with with blinders on. Heck, they sleep with blinders on. They practice their faith with blinders on. Such a sad thing, but but there's a lot to dig into here. All right, guys. So jump back here to the beginning. All right, what a lovely bunch of souls and faces that I am so pleased to call my brothers and sisters. What a gift, the word of God. And our daily bread here today is this, Amos chapter 5. And if you're new, I'm Rex, and this is a chance for us to go walking in this word. Now, midway through our time in this book, 
nine chapters, I believe, total in Amos. And here, in chapter 5, we have a section of literature comprised of many brief, but nonetheless impactful prophetic oracles. Justice, like obedience, is key to this book and this work. And today, Amos pictures justice for us as, as a mighty river fed by justice's powerful, powerful current, its powerful flow. Unlike floodplains or, or small streams, justice is to be like the Mississippi, like the Nile, like the Amazon, like the Rhine. Justice is to be a powerful and unshakable constant. For something to be unstoppable, it holds that it must have a start, a, a founding, an establishment, and as spoken of in verse 15. Let's read that real quick. Verse 15 says, Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. Okay, guys, so over chapter 5's course, Amos makes clear the powerful, capable, and, and in charge, they must change the court. They must stomp out and squash injustice and provide those in need the ways and means to live. A right and true religion, an honest faith, must desire and act out of love and glorify God in our actions. Regardless of where we call home, and the culture that surrounds us, we are called to mirror, to mimic, to proclaim the mind of Christ into this world. It was the same then. To give our all as he gave his all for us. Let our lives and all that they are made of and consist of be a living sacrifice, that which is a pleasing and worthwhile aroma that, that wafts up to heaven and puts a smile on the face of our loving, gracious, and merciful Creator God. Verse 1. Hear this word which I take up against you, a lamentation, O house of Israel. So again we are confronted with the fact that all of this stems from love, not from anger, not from hate. It stems from love and true care because you must punish what is wrong in order to guide those you love. God nor Amos hate these people. These are their people. These are God's children, God's chosen. And more than just a lawsuit, today's work, as it says, it's a lament, it's a lamentation, it is an outpouring, a mourning for those which are loved. Verse 3. For thus says the Lord God, the city that goes out by a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which goes out by a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. Whether intentional or not is unclear, but certainly the intense um, militaristic reversals here seemingly echo prophetic disasters featured in the covenant outlined originally in Deuteronomy chapter 32, all throughout that chapter it talks about it, wherein they are the righteous reaction to blatant and direct idolatry. These, these prophetic woes, these prophetic disasters are what happens. They are a direct consequence of this blatant and direct idolatry. Verse 4. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Seek me and live. Guys, it couldn't be more simple, but so many still won't do it. Reading this, I want to cry because I ran for so long. And so many continue that same foolish, evasive maneuver. 
but all they are evading, like all that I was evading, was goodness and love and the chance to be reborn and to have something great. This is more than a plea here, though it is an impassioned one. It's also a promise. Repent. Turn back no matter where you are, whether you're in exile, whether you're in filth, whether you're completely consumed by the fog of pride and the hungers of the flesh, repent, be reborn, and claim the eternal prize of faith. Look at verse 7, guys. Thank you all for letting me share with you. You who turn justice to wormwood and lay righteousness to rest in the earth. You who turn justice to wormwood and basically and bury righteousness is what it's saying. So what does he mean when he says turn justice to wormwood? Well, justice like righteousness are qualities solely established in God Almighty. Our ability to carry them out only comes by way of God within us and in our lives. At their purest forms, they are offshoots of the very goodness of God. Now, in contrast to justice, we see wormwood. Wormwood is an herb that was common to Upper Africa and the Eurasian steppes. One that in its pure state is absolute poison. Now, those at the time were very aware of this, and so this would have been a very impactful metaphor for them, whereas today we kind of have to explain it a little bit to really get the effect of it. But it's saying, you know, don't turn this great, wonderful, worthwhile thing that is from God, this thing, justice, and turn it into something that is pure and bitter. You know what I mean? Think about it. God, when you condense him down, is all of these good things, goodness and light and love, right? But now you have, in contrast, wormwood, something which, when you condense it down to its purest state, only becomes a more and more um, effective poison. We want the opposite of that. We have the opposite of that. All right, guys. Let's look at verse 13. Therefore, the prudent keep silent at that time, for it is an evil time. So how could... Being knowingly prudent ever lead to silence. Well, such is the outcome when truth is not simply rejected, but is in fact no longer tolerated. Do you hear me? Does it sound familiar, maybe? Verse 19, guys. My thoughts and prayers go out to everyone in Canada right now. Verse 19. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. So I want you to imagine for a minute, comically in your mind, I want you to imagine you come around a corner and there's a lion. So you're like, oh my God, and you take off running around the other corner, you jump over a fence, and on the other side of the fence is a bear. But then you escape the bear, you dip into the house, you're like, oh my God, I made it, thank goodness, nothing happened. Put your hand on the wall, snake bites you. That's what it's like to think that you could run from God. Not, not an author by profession, but with breath of God inspiration, Amos does good at, at, at vividly voicing the futile, worthless, and foolish nature of trying to outrun an omnipotent God and his righteous outpouring of justice. Verse 20, guys. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? He's saying, you know, if you reject God and you push God away and you don't want anything to do with God, then all there's going to be left is darkness. The only source of light is God. Not only spiritually, but truly physically. None of this would be here without him. A Amos is basically, I'm sorry, here... Brightness in the original Hebrew is more than light. The word is in fact associated right off the bat with the divine, with the illumination that comes only from the Lord. No guiding light, no shining countenance, judgment will swallow up the land in blackness and totality. Verse 21, guys. I hate... I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. He's saying, 
These things aren't pleasing to me. Amos uses a, a Hebrew style of hyperbole to really hit the point home, to really emphasize it. It could have just as easily read, um, you know, I hatefully despise your feast days. It, it's really emphatic, this, this disdain for this superficiality. Verse 23, guys. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. No matter how pleasant or, or, or melodic or, or, you know, any of that, superficial praise to God can only be received by him as nails on a chalkboard. How could it be anything else? Translated as noise, the root original word speaks of a loud, clamoring din, a, a, a unpleasant, audible disturbance, not what God desires, and certainly it does not seek or 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 achieve the the task of glorifying God, which is the point of praise and worship. Verse 26, guys. You also carried Sekuth, your king, and Chayun, your idols, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. When it comes to idolatry and pagan practices, the Old Testament features many, and rightly so, attacks on, on those who worship an, an item, a, a created thing, something that they have made. Think about, think about, think about, why, why would you ever put all this effort into worshiping something that you yourself created? I'm just going to go out on a limb here, and it's a little bit funny, but it's not really a funny issue. It would basically be like if you made a grilled cheese sandwich, and then you said, hey, grilled cheese sandwich, what should I do with my life? Sh should I do this? Should I do that? Is that right? Is that wrong? Come on, grilled cheese, give me some guidance. That's basically what's going on with all of this. And so you can see how, how if it wasn't such a serious and awful thing, it would be laughably foolish. Verse 27, let's look at that. It'll be the last one I got to share with you guys today. And again, thank you for letting me, and I apologize for this porcupine hairdo. Therefore, I will send you into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. So this can seem like, you know, it's, it sounds a little bit bad to us today. You know, you're going to be sent away. You're going to be, you know, kind of exiled. But if you understand this as they would have understood it when this was written, this was the worst of the worst, guys. Uh, original readers would have understood exile to be far more than we do today because it was to be pushed away from your home. And absolutely everything you know and everyone you understand and love. This is the absolute worst of the covenant curses, at least as far as they were concerned. And so we see that as a closing point by Amos. Um, hey guys, if you're not subscribed, smash the subscribe button. I drop a new video like this six days a week and I promise Father God tells us that he has no greater joy than to know that his children... Walk in the truth, not that they own the truth, not that they have read the truth or that they have heard the truth or that they even share the truth with others, but that they walk in the truth, that they take these things, they read them, they take them to heart and they use them as the, as the, the framework against which to live day to day hour to hour, and thank goodness we don't have to try to do this alone. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us to guide us, to lead us moment to moment to be able to help us in recreating the very mind of Christ. Um, hit the bell if you want notified every time I drop a new video, guys. Give this one a thumbs up if you liked it. Share it if you loved it. If you have any prayer requests, comments, questions, suggestions, if you have a, a witness or a testimony not only would i love to hear it but i promise other people need to hear it and it will absolutely glorify god to tell your story of of coming to faith in our lord and savior jesus christ and there is no wrong way to come to faith and there is no one way better than the other it's only that we get there guys um 
I love you all so much. Father God loves you even more. So do me a favor. Go out there. Have a blessed and wonderful day because why wouldn't you? And let somebody you see today who maybe you wouldn't think about it normally, go up to them and just let them know that Jesus loves them. That's it. I promise they need to hear it.